Hello there, Center Point Online Campus. So glad you can join us today. Let's get ready to worship our Lord together.
Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Father, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you that you're always with us through the flames, through the fire, Father. When the waters are crashing over us, Lord, you are there standing beside us always. We thank you for that. Holy Spirit, open up our hearts. May we receive what you've prepared for us today, Lord. We thank you in your son's precious name. Amen, church, amen. Hello, Centerpoint. Welcome to our online campus. So glad that you made Centerpoint a part of your day. I hope I'm not jumping the gun here, but I can't help it. The weather's been warming, the snow is gone, the days have been getting longer, they're playing baseball in Florida, and now we've turned the clocks ahead an hour. Guys, I know it's not official until next week, but whatever, I'm calling it. We've made it through the winter. Spring has sprung, and that is truly something to be thankful for. But what do you guys think? Am I jumping the gun a little bit? Uh, wherever you're watching from, let us know in the chat. What do you think? Are you expecting one last gasp of winter weather where you are? Or do you finally think that we're in the clear? The live chat's a great place to interact with the Centerpoint online community. So I encourage you all to let us know where you're watching from. Uh, we have hosts and prayer team members that are there uh, live right now if you have anything you need uh, prayer for today. So I encourage you, don't be shy. And if you're checking out Centerpoint for the first time ever, welcome. We're so honored to have you here. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out in the chat, but I wonder if there's one other thing that you'd do for us today to let us know that you're watching with us, and that's fill out our digital connect card. Uh, this is a great way for us to know that you are here with us today. Uh, give us a chance to answer any questions that you may have and see how we can best serve you. So fill that out with as much info as you feel comfortable sharing with us, and I really hope that you just enjoy the service today. I also wanna give a huge thanks to everyone who's giving so generously online uh, to support the mission and vision of Centerpoint Church. And as I'm sure you all know by now, we're launching two new campuses in Stony Brook and Holbrook in just a few weeks on Palm Sunday. And uh, a, few a few weeks ago, we launched an audacious giving campaign to raise the necessary funds for those campuses. So this is the last week of that campaign. So if you've been planning to give, then this is your moment. I wanna give a huge thank you to everyone who gave towards this goal. We only have $74,000 left to hit the goal that we set. So if you wanna make a donation today, remember you can give online at cpchurch.com give. And if you're uh, giving through the app or on the website, on the drop-down menu options, select multi-site hashtag Brooklyn to Montauk to make that donation to support the campus launches. Now coming up on March 17th, that's this Wednesday, St. Patrick's Day is one of my favorite nights of the month. It's our United service, our monthly night of worship and prayer. And it's always an awesome night because we gather together from all the different campuses to worship God as one church. And it's gonna be live from our Massapequa campus beginning at 7.30. Just like last time, there's gonna be no online reservations for United. It's going to be first come, first seated until we reach capacity. So if you're thinking of attending in person, I suggest getting to the Massapequa campus a little early, think maybe around 7 p.m. Stop, grab yourself a shamrock shake to enjoy as you wait for the service to kick off. And of course, we'll be streaming live online, so I look forward to seeing a bunch of you live there as well. All right, now it's time for us to jump into today's message from Pastor Brian as we continue our current series, Influencer. Let's do it.
Well, hello everyone at Centerpoint. I wanna welcome you today to our online campus. I'm so glad that you are joining us no matter where you are, whether you're on home or vacation, driving in the car. If you are driving in the car, please watch the road and just listen. But uh, nonetheless, we are glad that you are here. And you know, today's kind of a, a, an interesting Sunday. Um, Pastor John re revealed this to me this week. But we are officially, for some of you, one year since the last time you've physically been at church as a result of COVID. Uh, it's been a year. Uh, on um, March 8th, that was our last Sunday that we had met before the shutdown had happened. And so as I was just thinking about that, I mean, that's heavy to realize that for some of you, I or your campus pastors have not seen you in such a long time. A, a year is almost unfathomable, but here we are. And I gotta say that I've still been so pleased and so proud of our church, of our pastors, of all the work, of all the tech team and everyone behind the scenes to make sure that we could stay as connected as possible in this season, from digital life groups to really making sure that this online campus was really the best thing that we could put out for you, whether it's the worship or the teaching. But it has been a year. And I gotta just say that um, I am so looking forward to as things continue to shift your homecoming, for you to come back to center point in person, handshakes and hugs. And I, I don't know what the timeline of 2021 is going to look like, but I am believing and hoping and excited for us to be all united again as center point across all of our campuses this year. And so we want you to know we love you. We miss you. If you haven't um, talked to anyone in a while, don't hesitate to reach out to your campus pastor this week. Uh, just let them know that you're excited to still be part of our church and you're glad to be connected and you've been listening and part of what God is doing here at our church. And so before I move on, I just want to pray for us. I just feel like a, a true burden and heaviness for those that, that have not been around in a while. And I just want to pray for you. So, so, so let's pray together. God, I do want to just lift up all those that are part of our church for this last year, as all of our lives have, have greatly been altered and shifted and we've been dealing with so much pressure and the emotional toll, let alone the spiritual toll that this time has had on us as people and us as a church. But God, I still know that for the thousand or so people that are connecting only digitally, God, they are just as much of our church as they've ever been. And God, I thank you that we have been united through this season. I thank you for all the opportunities, the Lord, that, that um, we've had to connect. God, I want to thank you for technology. I never thought I would thank you for Zoom, but I thank you for Zoom. And Lord, the way that we're still able to love one another in this hard time. I pray for those that have just been really struggling emotionally and relationally, just feeling that level of anxiety and depression that I know many of us have been going through. God, I pray for a calming upon their hearts, Lord. And I pray in the name of Jesus that this will end so quickly, so soon now, Lord, and that we will all be able to gather, together, uh, gather together again and worship you in person as one body. I lift this up to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, friends, uh, here we are in this series called Influencer. And we started last week. It's a three-week series as we lead into Holy Week, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. And we really wanted to make sure that we're realizing that God has something deeply significant for us as the church to do while we're on earth. And last week we learned from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 23, and there was one verse that I continued to kind of thread through the entire message. Let me read it to you again. And if you, you, you missed last week's message, I really encourage you to go back on YouTube, on Facebook, find it and listen to it. And it says this, verse 22. Paul says that I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul's taking this deep responsibility of being an influencer in the world for Jesus Christ. He's going to do whatever it takes to get there. And if I could summarize last week's message, it would simply be this, that we need to prioritize people over preferences. We need to prioritize people over 
preferences. Uh, there's so much in the church world in our life that are a preference, and that's fine. You can have that, but we can't put that over people. If there's something we can do different to reach someone else for Christ, just like Paul was talking about, we need to be willing to take that step because people are more important than what we prefer in our life, what we prefer in church, what we prefer in relationships, and we need to have this mindset as Paul has. Now today, I want to continue in this series, and I want to talk about this idea. I want to talk about how to influence the world without letting the world influence you. How to influence the world without letting the world influence you. Is there a time in your life that you were supposed to set a standard, but you failed horribly? <laughs> like you just, you didn't even come close to what you were supposed to do in that scenario. Uh, I'll give you a, a little tidbit about me. Uh, something you never want me to do, if you were a parent, something you never want me to do is to watch your children. I'm just, I'm just going to put that out there. Not because I don't love kids. I love kids. I think kids are amazing. One of my favorite things on a Sunday is just to see all the kids at the church. But I, I have a unique gift with children. I make them into the worst version of themselves. I don't know what it is. I think when most kids see me, they just see like, look, here's a big child. And since he's a big child, I can just act like I would with any other child. And we'll often have new people at the church. And within 30 seconds of me talking to their kids, they're punching me and kicking me. And the parents mortified like, no, you can't hit the pastor. And the thing is, is that when I'm with kids, they, you know, suddenly the floor becomes lava to me too, right? And I'm saying things like poopy face. And I just, I, I don't necessarily elevate children to that adult standard. I lower myself and I'm just like them. I'm a horrible babysitter. But as a result, I always end up in the corner, you know, without snacks for time out. But the point is here is even though that may be the case, I'm sure we all have things in our life where we find that, you know what, we were supposed to set a standard that we didn't quite hit. Yet as Christians, we are called to be influencers in the world. But if we're honest with ourselves, I think we can all admit how easy it is to let the culture influence us as opposed to the other way around. So let's learn how to overcome not being what God wants us to be. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. So here in John chapter 17, Jesus is about to be arrested. He's now praying to the Father. And as he prays, he's praying for his current disciples, the 12. And then he also prays for those that will become his disciples, those that will put their faith in him after the fact. And while he's praying for his disciples, Jesus helps us understand our role in influencing the world. I want to start at John 17, 13, and I'm going to, as I often do, just kind of read a couple of verses and explain them before we move on in the passage. And so here we are, John 17, 13. Jesus says, I am coming to you now, speaking to the Father. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world hates them. Uh, and the, sorry, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. There's two key words here that we need to understand to, to really um, know what Jesus is saying here. The, the word word and the word world. And so let me start with the word word. When he says your word, speaking to God, he, he means the revelation of eternal life. He means the kingdom of God, the thing that he's been preaching this entire time over the three years. That's the revelation he's speaking of. That's the word that he's speaking of, what God has given him to say. And Jesus is saying because of this knowledge that they have, because of this understanding that they have, my disciples are now going to be hated just as I am hated. And as a result of this knowledge, they're no longer going to fit in the world like other people. There's something now different and unique about these men and those that will also trust in me as a result of them. He also then talks a lot about the world, uh, the, the way the, the world is going to reject them. 
See, the world doesn't mean the physical creation of the world. He's not talking about petunias and plants and animals. No, when he, he's talking about the world here, he's, he's talking about the systems of the world. Uh, this has more to do with society, with culture, with philosophy, with the values and the systems that people put into place as a result of what they believe. And, and that's the world that he is talking about. That could be everything from just the government to the, 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 the subtle systems that we have in society of, of how we interact with one another and how our values influence the way we raise our kids or what we teach in schools. That's, that's the world that he is speaking of right now. And so just as Jesus wasn't from the world, now those that put their faith in him because of the word, the revelation of Christ in their life, they're not going to fit in the world as well. Does anyone connect with that? Do you feel that in your own life right now? He continues in verse 15. Jesus says then, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Jesus is saying, listen, Father, I, I need them here. Like, I'm not asking you to remove them because they're going to be hated. They, they need to stay in the world. They have a job to do in the world. But because of the, the, the tension they're going to feel, because of the pressure they're going to feel, here's going to be my, my request to you. Will you protect them from the evil one? And when he says evil, when he doesn't just mean generic evil, he, he's literally talking about the battle between uh, uh, Satan and his, his demonic influence and that of being a Christian and a follower of Christ. Friends, there is a very real battle that is happening. There is a spiritual battle that is happening. And everyone that is a Christian is in fact part of that battle. You feel it. And so Jesus is saying, no, listen, I need to, to pray while, while my disciples are in this hostile environment called the world, that you protect them. <laughs> because it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be hard. And then verse 16, he goes on. He says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. He's reiterating verse 14. But then he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For, uh, for them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. He's referring to the cross there at the end. But here he's talking about this word sanctify, which is such an important word for us to understand, especially in the context of what he is saying of being part of the world. Because sanctify means to make holy, to be separate, to be used specifically for God, for, the, for the, the purpose of God. This is the process of actually us becoming more like Jesus. Our sanctification continues through our life and our faith. And so Jesus is praying for God's power to make them different, to make them different than the world, to sanctify them in such a way that they are now holy in the world that they live in. It's with this in mind that I have two points, two things that I want us to wrestle with today from the words of Jesus on how to influence the world around us. And here's the first thing. This is really a reiteration of last week's message, but it's here in the text. And I want to hit this again because I think it's so important. The first thing I want us to know are that Christians are to be in the world. Christians are to be in the world. <laughs> You know, it's hard to influence something that you're not part of. Uh, let me continue to be super clear when it comes to Centerpoint and what it means to be part of Centerpoint. We are what is often described as a missional church. We are a church on mission. We have a purpose in the world, as I believe every church should, but we identify it and we're active in this mission. That everyone who's part of our church, I would even go as far as to say you're a missionary, that you are someone who is being sent by God for the work of God in the area that you find yourself in. And we are a missional church. And in verse 18, let me say it again. Jesus says, as you sent me into the world, as Jesus left heaven and went into the world on mission, he says, I have sent them into the world, being his disciples. That he's sending them into the world. How cool is it? When you really think about it, how cool is it that God wants to use us to advance his kingdom? 
Like we get to be part of this. He, he, he's, he's bringing us into the process of saying there's, there's horrible things in the world. There's hatred in the world. There's evil in the world. I'm the solution. And guess what? I'm going to use you to help make a difference to bring the good news of Jesus, to act the way a Christian is supposed to act, to bring peace where there is hardship, where people are lost, to help them to be found when they're dead, to help them to come to life in Christ. He wants us to be part of the process. And I'll tell you why. It comes back to one of these famous verses in scripture that many do know, but it's just a great reminder of why Jesus came and then why Jesus sent us. John 3, 16, when Jesus is talking to this religious leader of the day, this Pharisee named Nicodemus, he tells Nicodemus of the heart of God and the purpose of why he's arrived. And he says, for God so loved the world, the world, the people of the world, that God so loved this broken um, distorted, perverted thing that's so far from him, but he's such a love still for it, for those that are made in the image of God, humanity. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus was sent with that mission and now we are sent with that mission as well because God loves the world. He loves it. And why did Jesus send us? Was it to hide? Was it to try to avoid conflict? Try to avoid uncomfortable situations? Did he, did he send us as Christians to create little church subcultures that are hidden from the world and we're all protected from it? No. He sent us into the world to complete the mission of the good news, the gospel that Jesus had started to point people to Christ. God hasn't made us to be hidden, but to be bold in the world for him. And let me just say, I I know, I know that many Christians right now in America are scared. Let's just call it out. Like I I, I get the shift in America culture. I, I understand it. I know that there is a a sweeping movement to to leave Judeo-Christian principles behind and and you feel it. Everyone does. We see it. It's constantly in the news. It's it's constantly being forced. And and I understand in the church that people are starting to panic and they're starting to freak out and they're, they're, they're scared about what this will mean for them and their kids and their grandkids and their life. And so many Christians simply want to run and hide. We want to leave the Northeast it's so challenging here. We, we, we don't like the, the attitude and the values, the worldliness of the Northeast. We don't like New York. We don't like where it's heading. Let's move to, to Alabama, right? Alabama is considered the most Christian state. I read this the other day. The most Christian state in America. Let's get all the Christians together. We'll move to one state and we'll make sure that, sa- that state saves, sa- stays safe by our votes. Let's all run and hide But I want you to know that's not what Jesus wants. That's not what he's asking you to do. He's not asking you to find safety. He's not asking you to run and hide. No, Jesus is actually sending us here to move forward in Long Island. Listen, if you're watching this, you're one of our our many families that have moved over the last year down south. I'm not saying this is a guilt trip to you. There are reasons to move. I get it. For many of you, it was even financial. I understand. We love you. You are our extended family. We're so thankful for you. But I still want to put this out there. That if you live on Long Island, the goal of leaving should not be, I need to run away from the worldliness of this area. The goal should be, I need to stay here because there needs to be light in the darkness. I'm not telling you that God doesn't want you to leave. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to have a prophetic word here saying, if you leave, you're ungodly. But I am saying, I want you to wrestle with the reality that we need to be the light in the darkness. Jesus is sending us to reach our island for Christ. And we must find ways to then be part of the world, to not simply hide away. I'll give you an example. 
for years, for the last 19 years, on a regular basis, someone's always said to me, Brian, we need to start a church softball league. I hear this all the time. Brian, we, we need a church softball league here at Center Point. I am a great softball player, and I, I want to use my gifts within our church. Let's join the Long Island Church Softball League. <laughs> and every time, I've said no. Not because I'm anti-softball. I'm not pro-softball. I'm not anti-softball. I take a neutral stance on softball. But the last thing we need to do is to create something else that could actually help us engage the community, now find a way to separate from the community and hide. And this is what I tell people. Like, listen, if you want to use your gifts in softball, I want you to. And I'm cool doing it as a church. But we're going to join the local league. We're going to find the Belmore or uh, uh, Massapequa. We're, we're going to find the Long Beach League. We're going to find the Kings Park League, the Bayshore League. We're going, to, we're going to find what's going on within our community, and we're going to join that. Because we don't need to hide. We need to be light. We need to be present. We need to be in their lives. We, we can't run away. And so church, hear me, I... I want us to know we're, we're not here to create simply safe Christian subcultures. Is there a time and place for safety? Yes. Should we always be gathering? Yes. Do we need to be strengthened together? Yes. But we only do that so that we can then be sent. So that we're prepared for what God has called us to do in the world. We don't need more subcultures. No. We need to be part of Long Island for the glory of God. And every opportunity that God opens up the door for us to be present, we need to then be present. You are sent. Yes, you. You are sent. The second thing I want you to see is that Christians are to not be of the world. We're to be in the world. But we're not to be of the world. So here's our tension. We live here on earth, and while we're here, we are to live in our communities. Uh, we're to serve as, as part of the PTA. We're to be police. We're, we're to be present in all aspects of life, government, business owners, neighbors, you name it. We as Christians are meant to be there, to be present. Yet we are not to let the systems of the world that contradict our faith have any control or influence over us. In other words, we are not to compromise who we are as believers in Jesus when it comes to being part of the world around us. Jesus said this in John 17, 16. He said, they are not of the world. His followers, his disciples, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. He's saying that the power of scripture, the power of the words of Christ, the, the, the revelation of what it is to be a follower of Jesus, this will, will change us. And that is what we're to live by, not the world, not the systems of the world. No, we're to be sanctified. We're to be set apart. We're made to be holy. We're not to be changed by the world. We are to change the world. Amen. We're to change it as we're set apart. And friends, as we live for God, our holiness is seen in how we serve the poor to how we avoid sin, how we love our spouse to how we overcome temptation. Holiness is seeing everything through the lens of God's will for our life. That's what it is to be sanctified. So make no mistake about it. We must be holy people in an unholy world. Uh, there, there is no justifying ungodliness in the life of the Christian. Uh, like this, this process of being sanctified, this call of holiness, th this is not something we can make light of or blow off or not think is important. John writes this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. Again, talk about the systems of the world. If anyone loves the world, Love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. John's making this clear distinction. 
The things of the world, they will pass away. They are temporary. They are not significant. They are not eternal. They are not of God. But the things of God, they are eternal. This is what is the, the priority of our life. This is what is significant. And don't let the systems of the world, the values of the world, pull you away. Because when you start living for those, you're no longer living for the Father. You're living for the world. You're living for your flesh. He's throwing the gauntlet down in these verses. He's like, get your act together, church. I know you're here. I know you're present in the world, but don't let it win over your mind and your heart and your soul. Don't let it get you. See, friends, you can't be a follower of Christ and not care about what God cares about. You can't be a follower of Christ and blow off the Bible. That is not the Christian faith. That is not an option for us. That's only a perverted form of Christianity that you've created really in your own image. Because you said, I'm going to take the parts of the Bible I like and I'm going to get rid of the others. And I think that's what a lot of us do, unfortunately. We, we don't take the full counsel of the word of God. Instead, we like a lot about it. I mean, obviously we're here, we're part of the church, we, you know, we're, we're worshiping Jesus, so, so there's a lot about the Bible we like, but there's just certain things that I don't like or I, I don't want to agree with. And so we'll be reading through the Bible and we'll get to one of those areas. Love your neighbor. <laughs> Do you know my neighbor? My neighbor, his name is Tom, man. You, you would not love my neighbor. Love, love my enemies? So you want me to love not just my annoying neighbor, but you want me to love my enemies. That doesn't make any sense to me. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to take it out of the Bible. I'm not, I don't need that, right? Oh, what's this say here? Oh, the Bible actually has a, 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 a perspective, a, a challenge, a call to how I perceive sex. Wait, it's saying that I shouldn't have sex unless I'm married to someone? Well, I'm only committed to this one person right now. What about that? You know, I'm, uh, I'm 34, single. Like, you, you want me not to have sex and not to lust? I, I, I mean, please, I'm, I'm not going to get rid of my Pornhub account, right? The Bible can't really mean that. And that's just so outdated. It, that, that can't be real. You know what? I'm just, I'm just going to get rid of that whole section of the Bible. That, that, that can't be for us today. I don't, I'm supposed to be generous. Generous with my... My money, the, the money I've worked so hard to, to acquire, that, that's mine. I'm, I'm supposed to have a heart of generosity. I'm supposed to help people in need. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to, to have a heart of giving an offering to the church. No, I don't like that either. I'm just, I'm gonna get rid of that. These are the things in the Bible I just don't like. And by the way, before you completely freak out and say, I can't believe pastor just tore up a Bible. It's a journal, all right? Calm down now. I would never tear up a Bible, all right? This is just a journal, don't start emailing me. But if you were outraged, if that did offend you, that for a second you thought, I can't believe he's tearing out scripture to make a point. I want you to think, how much does it, do you think it breaks the heart of God when you tear out scripture by saying, I'm not gonna live by it and say, I'm gonna do whatever I want instead? God finds that outrageous. See, friends, no, we need to make sure we understand we are called to be holy people. We're called to look and live differently by the standard of God, not the standard of the world. And by the way, this is why I think this is so important in this series of influencer, because not being of the world is exactly what is ultimately gonna draw people to us. This is gonna be the draw of why people are gonna want to know who we are and why we live the way we do. It's, it's gonna influence people. Because once the world chews people up and spits them out, who do you think they're going to turn to? Uh, the one that has stood strong in their faith through the entire season, through their life. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect, but, but you can still tell the difference of someone trying to live a godly life for someone who doesn't care to live a godly life, whether they fall or not. Now they're going to turn to the person who stood strong in their faith, the, the one who lived differently, who lived holy, who lived extending grace and love to people that no one else would want to. And when they come to you, they will reach out to you for answers because they know that the world has let them down. They'll know that the system of the world has not worked. It promised fulfillment. It promised purpose, but it left them empty and broken and needing something else. The very thing you have that was seen has a bright light in a dark world because you lived a holy, godly life. Friends, a holy life is one of the greatest influences we can have. Recently, a friend 
of mine from high school reached out to me on Facebook. It was probably about eight, nine months ago. And you know what's so funny is even to this day, this person, when I put up a, a post about my faith, I still imagine them rolling their eyes. Now, I haven't been to high school in 26 years, right? I'm like, I, I've been out of that world a long time. I've been alive far longer than I, I was when I was in high school. Like, how could someone still have an impact? And, uh, uh, just, you know, a person in my mind as I'm putting a post up all this time later. But uh, there it is. And nonetheless, about eight, nine months ago, they reached out to me. They'd hit rock bottom. Going through hardship. Someone that I know hates Christianity. I know in the past have always looked down on me because I'm a pastor. I dedicate my life to letting other people know about Jesus and they think that is the complete waste of time and a scam and foolish. Yet, what happens when this person is let down by everything else? They asked for help. Not only that, they asked for prayer from a God they don't even believe in. See, what's so significant about that, friends, is even those that you are looking at you now, they're mocking you, they're saying you're foolish, they're, they're, they're saying living for, for God, for Jesus is a fairy tale. Why would anyone intelligent ever live that way? They're still the people that at some point will realize the real foolishness, the real fairy tale is the system of the world that actually has led them nowhere. And they're gonna find you and they're gonna seek you and they're gonna ask you about who your God really is. Why? Because you've been living a holy life that has been secretly influencing without them even knowing. Church, we can never be true influencers of the world. We can never be true influencers for Jesus until we understand that we are called to be in the world, but not of it. Uh, let me close with this analogy. When I was on my honeymoon, um, one of the, the cool things that my wife and I had done, and we went to St. Lucia, it was, I think it was the first time I had ever been in the Caribbean, um, but we were out and we, we took a, a day trip um, to a, a reef, and we got to go snorkeling. It was such a, a cool experience, you know, except I, I couldn't hold my breath long, so I always felt gypped. I'd, I, I'd start to, to get down a little closer to, to see something I thought was interesting, but then I'd have to quickly come up and catch my breath. So it always got me to the point where, where I wanted to go scuba diving. Like I, I wanted to, to get the, the whole license and all the approval. There's a place in Long Island you can do that and, and become a scuba diver. But here's the thing, I'm cheap and I'm lazy, so I never did, but I always wanted to. And the thing is, is if you go scuba diving, here's what's so fascinating about it. You get immersed in the underwater world, right? Like you go scuba diving, to, the thought of like being in the reef, to, to get down in there and to see the fish up close and to, to see the reef and the whole ecosystem of that world, that sounds so fascinating to me. Especially if you're an oceanographer, right? So your, your whole job, your whole purpose is to go and study it, to protect it, to help it, to help the environment. Like that's an incredible thing to do. Yet the thing is, even when you're underwater, no matter how much you love it, when you're in the underwater world, you're still not of it, are you? You're still a stranger, you're still a tourist. Like, like that is not your home. Even the fish, as they swim by, you're like, bro, you don't belong here. They know, like, you know, the sharks are swimming overhead and like, I can probably eat that. Never seen it before, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a bite. Because at the end of the day, no matter how much we may be underwater and immersed in that world and immersed in that system, we are not part of it. Because the only reason you're able to be down there and live is because you have a tank on your back of the air from where you belong. <laughs> that air is what is keeping you alive. And if you ever get to the point where you're like, you know what, I, I wanna live here so badly, I I'm gonna ditch everything else and I'm gonna be part of, of this underwater world. I'm gonna get rid of my air tank. You're gonna live only a couple of minutes, but eventually you're gonna die. It's gonna be over for you. You're going to drown in that underwater world because that is not where you are meant to live. That is not where you get your life. No, it's temporary. And see, I think one of the problems, friends, for many of us is that we think that we belong in the world and to live by the systems of the world, and we don't. 
We get our life. We get our very oxygen from Christ. We are part of his kingdom, the kingdom of God. This is what is temporary. And we are here for a purpose. We are here for the good news of Jesus. That is why we are here now. But this is not where we can live. And when we try to live in the world by the systems of the world, it is going to spiritually kill us. The most unhappy Christians I know are those that have put their faith in Jesus, but they're still living like the world. You can never find satisfaction in Christ living that way. Uh, there's just no way to, to do that and, and expect our, our, our life to be um, what Christ has called us to, to be flourishing and to live life to the full. Friends, I want you to hear me. We are called to be in this world, but not of the world We have to keep our air tanks on. We have to stay connected to the source of our life. We have to live the way he has called us to live. And I want you to know that as we do this, we can influence so many people on Long Island for Jesus. But we have to be willing to make sure we're influencing for him. So if there's something in your life, areas of your life, Parts of your life, you know you've let the world system take over and control you and dictate your actions. Maybe today is the day you say enough. That when I'm with my friends that have nothing to do with my faith or with my church, I need them to see a difference in me, to see what a godly life looks like. And I, I know they may mock me. I know they, they may ridicule me. I, I know they may call me some names, but... But I know ultimately that is how they're going to see the light of Christ. And so I need to live for him, not for the world. Let's close in prayer. God, I just come before you right now and I lift up this message and I I lift up the significance of us being influencers for your name on this earth. God, and I pray that you will challenge and convict our hearts because we all have areas. I have areas, God, that I know I've allowed certain systems of the world to have more influence and sway than they should when you are calling us to holiness. And so, God, I, I just bring that before you and I ask for forgiveness. Lord, because we all know how powerful the pull and the tug of the world is, God. Whatever area in our life that that we've let it consume us and take over and push out what we know is your word and your truth, God, may we just say right now, no, I don't want anything that holds me back from living the life you've called for me to live. I am going to be in this world, but I'm not going to be of it. I'm of your world and your world alone. Jesus, give me the strength just as Jesus prayed for his disciples to overcome the evil one in my life. We lift this up to you. In your name we pray, amen. And on the third 
so glad you were able to join us today as we continued Influencer, our new series. If you haven't done so already, I want to encourage you and remind you right now to fill out that digital connect card so we can connect with you throughout the week. God bless you guys, and I'll see you guys next Sunday.